public programs manager at the Museum of the African Diaspora. And I'm really happy all of you are joining us for this afternoon's African Book Club to discuss the book Triangulum by Masande Nishanga. And um, as we you know, start this event, I always think it's important to ground us in the time that we're living in. So MOAD stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter as there are multiple pandemics killing us, including the ongoing systemic violence against Black people. We honor and mourn the senseless murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, Tonya McDade, Jonathan Price, Casey Goodson Jr., Patrick Warren Sr., and so many others who have lost their lives at the hands of police brutality and racial injustice, including those whose names we do not know. We want to acknowledge that as this list of names unfortunately continues to grow, we will continue to say them and continue to bring awareness in the fight for real racial justice for the Black community. Before we get into today's event, I also want to acknowledge the spaces that, that we're occupying. And though we're gathering virtually, many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcibly brought to this continent. And our institutions were founded upon the exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples whose lands we are located on. It's with deep respect that Moad acknowledges that even in the virtual space, our people, our work, and our network servers are all on native lands. And we thank the indigenous peoples of the Bay Area and beyond who've stewarded this land throughout the generations. And so the African Book Club is a series that Moad has been so fortunate to partner with Faith Ariele for now since fall 2019, which is incredible. Um, and we have since transitioned to making this virtual, which has really expanded our audience. So we're really lucky that there's many of you who are joining from outside of the Bay Area, outside of California, outside of the United States. Um, and another really exciting element of now taking this program virtual is that we actually get to have our authors join us in some cases like today. So I'm gonna just give you a brief overview of the structure of today's program um, and then pass it off to Faith who will be moderating. So for the first um, about 45 minutes, um, we're going to be having a conversation with the author that Faith will be moderating. So our author, he'll be joining us um, about 15 minutes after. Um, and so if you have any questions that you would like to ask the author, please send those directly to Faith um, via the chat and she will incorporate those into her conversation that she has with him. Um, and then he'll probably hop off the call um, a little bit before one or around one. And then we'll continue to have um, just a group conversation, all of us for the remainder of the time, just discussing things that they have in their initial conversation, your thoughts about the book. Um, and so in that time, when everyone's talking, we just ask that you know, you're mindful of the space, respect everyone's participation. And so um, make sure that after you speak, give it another couple of people a chance to speak before contributing again. Um, if you have something to share, raise your hand, or I know there's a, a function in the, in the chat, I think, to have your hand raised so that we can you know, make sure everyone gets a chance to speak. Um, but with that, we're really excited to be talking about this book. Um, I know it's been, a couple, it's been almost a month and a half since we all gathered, um, so it's nice to see familiar faces again. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Faith um, to get us started. Thank you so much, Nia. Fabulous job as always. Welcome everyone. Happy New Year. Happy New Administration. Happy New Everything. <laughs> I'm feeling shiny and good. Um, so um, I think that I think we pretty much covered everything. Um, and oh, I just want to let you know if it's your first time here, we do discuss the end of the book. You don't have to have read read everything, we don't expect that at all. Maybe you haven't read the book at all, but if you haven't read the end, there will be spoilers just so you know, because we don't we don't hold back uh, if people wanna discuss the end. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. Um, <clears throat> and I think that um, if you got the invitation, you already read about him and how um, kind of, how he like burst onto the scene, new generation South African author with that first book, The Reactive about, um, that wasn't sci-fi, that was um, really kind of dealing with a, a young man, HIV positive young man. And um, so uh, this is a bit of a departure, but he's, uh, you know, 
really gotten a lot of attention. Um, plus, this book was published by a small press, uh, which is one of the things that's exciting for us to be able to do to support uh, small presses. Um, so pa Pamela asking, how do we choose the books for book club? We go through a, a variety of lists. So basically, um, what books were shortlisted for various African prizes? So the Atisalet Prize, the Kane, the, um, there are a number of ones, most of them named after breweries. Um, what uh, Brittle Papers, uh, Best List, Wrap Up. So we're just basically looking at African generated lists of kind of uh, what books people are excited about. Um, then we're also looking for representation um, keeping in mind that Nigeria and South Africa are the greatest producers of literature. So we try not to have them, you know, totally dominate the list. So we're also looking for places we haven't heard from. So I think next month's book is going to be Somali. That's, you know, a, that's a group we've been trying to read from. Um, and then we just, uh, yeah, we just narrow down the list and then we look at them and kind of figure out what would be interesting uh, what would be like exhausting and hard to read during a pandemic? <laughs> what has multiple availabilities? So is it available in audiobook, ebook, and a uh, hard copy? Um, at one point, we were trying to get books that were not being uh, were not being published in the West necessarily because we realized that that you know still then like London and New York and France are kind of determining what is African literature, but then it became hard to find those books. So we're trying to get books that, you know, we think we can find globally because they have international uh, publishers. So that's kind of what it is, just monitoring uh, what's getting a lot of buzz. And since there is um, this renaissance of African literature, there's a lot of places to look now for exciting things. So that answers the question. Uh, any other questions before, uh, while we're killing time, waiting for our author to show up? Um, Faith, where do you teach when you're not running our book club? <laughs> I just stay in the closet. <laughs> I'm just like folded up in the, <laughs> in the closet and then they take me out <laughs> uh, once a month. I teach at California College of the Arts. Okay. And um, that's actually where I started. Um, I, I taught contemporary African literature. I proposed a contemporary African literature class there back in 2015. And I was talking about it on Facebook and all these people were like, can I audit? And I'm like, no, but um, that's how I came up with the idea of, you know, having a, a community-based African book club that would be free for folks in the community and they could read along with whatever I was reading in my class. And then it just continued from there. So that's how it all it all came up about. Good. So. I did not know that. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. And I teach a lot of places, other places as well. I teach in a low residency program and stuff, but um, in private stuff but, and at the Grotto, but mainly um, CCA is my bread and butter. Yeah, I have lots of questions about structure that I'm going to hit him with. <laughs> Like um, when I was reading it, my mom like ran off with it. She's living with us now. And so she like disappeared with it for one day and then she came back and she's like, hmm, okay, done. I have some questions, but she like, she won't log on because she doesn't believe in Zoom. But she's, she, one of her questions was, was about structure and all the different genres. Uh, and she's like, that could have been three books. So it'll be really interesting to have a conversation about that. Uh, yeah, and I definitely want to have, you know, I have questions for him about the process. So has anyone read uh, the first book, The Reactive? Or was anyone aware of him before? Okay. Yeah, I hadn't heard about The React. I was hearing about this book a lot and chose this. And then, late, and then later when I was researching him, then heard about the other one, The Reactive. Um, but I think this, will this be our third Afrofuturistic title, I think? We did Dilman Dila, we did Neti Okorafor. I think that was it, right? And now Masande, who is at the door. Everybody put on your party frocks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, what? Are you ready? Dressed up? <laughs> Forgot my earrings. <laughs> I got mine on. <laughs> 
And oh my goodness. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> You're muted. Hello. I was just saying thank you for welcoming me. Oh, no, of course. We're so happy you could make it. What time is it where you are? Um, it's now 16 minutes past 10. Okay. That's not too bad. That's not too bad, then. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. We have I have some... my caffeine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then our exciting conversation, which will keep you awake as well, right? <laughs> of course, of course, of course. We have someone who's uh, dialing in from India, actually, at it's 1.30 in the morning, so. Oh, wow. Okay, right? yeah. Well. yeah. Yeah. I have it much easier. I have it much easier. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So we so appreciate you being here. Um, and we ha we're starting to get a lot of questions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with a few questions. Uh, and then at some point, uh, I'll bring in audience questions as well. And we're hoping that you can stay for about 45 minutes. Okay. For you, though, I'm, I will charm you so much that you'll want to stay more. That's just, <laughs> just warning you. That's normally what happens. But anyway, um, I'm Faith, by the way. <laughs> okay. Nice to meet you, Faith. <laughs> nice to meet you. Asande. <laughs> Asande. And uh, that's Nia and Elizabeth, who you've been talking to on email, are here as well. Uh, they're at the museum. So great. Um, Okay, well, thank you so much for uh, spending time with us. And most people have uh, read the book. There may be some people who haven't finished it, but you know, we've told them that you know it's fine that we'll be this. So you don't have to hold anything back if you want to talk about the ending or that sort of thing. Uh, but we have a lot of questions about structure and genre. Um, and I've been reading about reading some interviews with you, and I was really intrigued where you said that after your first novel you became obsessed with the idea of the three act narrative and that that's where the motif of the triangle came in and that uh, the novel structure is, is derived from this idea of using mystery, science fiction and coming of age and then exploring the three act narrative using three genres, which just, can you talk a, a bit more about that? <laughs> sure, no problem. <laughs> Um, so after I'd finished writing my first novel, um, I felt as if I had gone in that particular direction that that book wanted. Mm -hmm. um, I felt I'd gone as far as I could, which was basically kind of um, a very loose structure, which didn't have um, very kind of strict plot points, you know. It, it followed more of a psychological logic, you know. Um, following the character, the character's thoughts, the character's memories, and um, was mainly preoccupied with, you know, the experience of the environment, the experience of the country, as well as um, the experience of, you know, their family and their friends. And um, I finished that, you know, and I was pretty much satisfied with everything that I'd learned there. But I always try to do different things with each yeah. project you know, um, whether or not I'm trying to answer certain questions for myself in regards to where I fit in in my society and also to answer certain things, you know, about the craft of writing itself. And so after I'd finished my first book, um, I started thinking a lot about this idea of, you know, plot and uh, the three act narrative, something that I'd never paid that much attention to before because I was more interested in, um, I guess, the more experimental aspects of you know, narrative fiction. Right. And I started to question myself, you know, and this kind of skewing of this model, whether or not it was something that I really found to be kind of trite and you know, contrived, and it wasn't kind of true to, um, to how I felt um, art should reflect life. Or whether or not it was just something that I was kind of evading because I found it difficult and challenging <laughs> and wasn't sure whether or not I could pull it off. Uh, <laughs> so I kind of sat on that in a while. And then I, I just figured, you know, I mean, explore it. You've done this thing with your first book. Right. Why don't you, you know, see whether or not you can pull it off with this one? And because I wanted to really make sure, um, I decided to like, explore everything I'd been interested in when it comes to plot. 
which included genre. So which included like this, this element of noir, this element of science fiction to just go all out, you know, and um, enjoy myself while I was doing it as well. And uh, that's kind of what began this thing um, that kind of guided it because if I encounter something, I should allow it into the book, um, allow it into the conversation, you know, whether or not it was the motif or um, the number of genres in the book or right. even the, the structure of the relationship between the three uh, main characters in the first part of the book. Mm. Um, so at that point, it, it all started to gel together and become really intuitive. Um, so that's how that happened. Yeah, it's fascinating. I love that, just allow it, allow it in. Yeah. Um, I love that. Well, so I'm really obsessed with structure and genre and and, and because I see them as kind of political designations and categorizations, kind of imposed power, and, and then how multicultural narratives can be enhanced by having a complex nonlinear structure that you know, demonstrates these overlapping realities or, te or temporalities. And I think, I mean, that's one of the things that was so intriguing about this, that you have this mix of genre, this fusion of genres, these distinct parts of the book, the different ways the information is conveyed to the reader, letters, scenes, documents, pop culture references, math, science, memoir, all of these things, cyber espionage, all within this container of the novel. But just on a practical level, like how did you map it and track it? Did it emerge fragmented or did you have like your narratives, you know, strung out and then you broke them apart and decided how to deliver them to the reader? Um, it was a bit of both. Um, I think, you know, the, in the sections of the book where the narrator is kind of um, flipping between the recordings and the memoir, mm -hmm. um, even though those take uh, place on different time scales, which is um, 99 and 2002, those kind of arrived more or less simultaneously to me. Um, but in terms of other parts, I had to at some point divide it and um, plot out each um, subplot. Mm -hmm. For example, um, when the characters are teens and they're trying to solve this mystery, that's something that I had to kind of take aside and develop as its own, um, um, as its own kind of separate world, mm -hmm. right? And then put it away and then work on the second section as well. But as I was doing this, I kind of knew that, you know, each part would be communicating because essentially I'm using the same character. And I was very much interested in this idea of um, taking this narrator through different ages and only really charting um, the development of, uh, of their consciousness and them as a person um, just through the way that they were narrating their story. Um, so subtle changes in language and subtle changes in how they perceive the environment, et cetera. Um, so I kind of knew that's what it had to be, but I also wanted each section to kind of be satisfying and almost self-contained um, as a narrative arc. And then to join all three of them, you know, after each thing plays out in each section. So that's kind of what I had in mind. Um, it seemed pretty daunting at first, but the more time I spent with the book, um, the more I lived in it, you know, the more I could give in again to that intuition. You know, a character would have said something maybe in passing in an earlier part of the book, and suddenly it's re-emerging now um, as I'm drafting later parts. And so that kind of communication became a, a, a constant thing, you know, um, and eventually it just felt like one big world Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I had certain memories of certain parts of the book that emerged as I was writing other parts and it just communicated with each other um, in a way that was also very interesting for me as a writer. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't always know which direction it was taking. Um, I was following the characters and I was following the narrative for a lot of the time as well. Mm -hmm. Wow, it sounds that sounds really fun, actually. <laughs> it sounds it was. Like fun once, for you. Once you once you get um, some of the the tougher, kind of more tedious stuff out of the way, it can be quite fun. Right. Because um, right. yeah, I was really interested, particularly in hitting all the right plot points for like mystery. Like mystery genre is something yeah. that I always felt um, has a very 
special relationship um, with the reader. Right. And, this, and, and how it kind of parcels reward for the reader at certain points to keep them engaged. And I was kind of very interested in that, in bringing back some of these um, more traditional delights, you know, from narrative. Like, okay, they've spoken to this person and this amount of the mystery is covered and, you know. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that puzzle. It's interesting that, because to me, it's, it seemed like there were multiple mysteries going on. I mean, obviously there's the, mis there are, their face value mysteries of who's doing this and where did these girls end up? But there's also the larger mystery, I think, um, that's rooted in the historical context, which is, you know, whose version of things can you can you trust? Um, and I think from, from the beginning, the book is announcing itself as it's this composed found text, you know, it's these documents. And so it's letting you know that um, there's some artifice involved but somebody yeah. is representing it as truth. Um, and then there's, you know, something saying, you know, referring to authors as these kind of pitiful mammals. <laughs> and then we're exploring narrative throughout. We've got memory, both personal and national. We've got reality. There's the idea. I felt like we had successive uh, unreliable narrators because there's, you know, adolescence, which is an unreliable lens. There's trauma there's the legacy of political history um, and then things get played out in mental illness and substance abuse and you know um, all these layers of kind of mystery the disappearance of the mother you know is she seeing things for real or are these hallucinations and so I was really interested in how the, I, the conventions of mystery kind of informed individuals as well as kind of the historical legacy here uh, and the idea that her parents were collaborators to me it just felt like many unspooling of mysteries going on here yeah absolutely um firstly thank you that that's a very beautiful description of the book i appreciate that thank you so much um yeah i guess it, it part of the mystery for me or rather why it's it's such a, a strong element in the book um had to do also with this investigation of what is true and what constitutes um knowledge whether not it's from personal narratives or like national narratives, you know. Um, growing up in South Africa, even though we have this wide, widely, you know, um, known and understood history, um, because we were so close to it as children, um, our parents were always afraid of kind of politicizing us too much. And even though we were growing within this context where there was all this political uprising and the violence, in terms of the stories that we heard passed down to us, you know, they were very scant. Um, there was almost like a conspiracy of silence, you know, which was hard to pierce through. Mm -hmm. um, even this, this idea uh, that you brought up about collaboration is mm -hmm. still something that's hardly discussed in that region, you know, where I also spent some of my childhood. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, one of my brothers jokingly said after I published this book, it had to change his name, you know, <laughs> because, <laughs> uh, because, you know, it was covering things that people don't uh, usually, you know, discuss, especially actually in, in literature as well. Mm. Um, so that's, that's definitely something that ran through the book and my preoccupation in writing it, you know, this investigation of what is true and what makes it to public knowledge. Right. And yeah, and so it kind of, it informs this theme as well, which intersects, you know, with what the character sees, what the character intuits, um, and then her life as a scientist as well. And whether right. or not this, this knowledge that can't be verified, but is very much felt that has always been with her throughout her whole life is whether legit, whether it's legit or, you know, it's just something that um, is in her head. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it interests me as a writer as well, because on one hand, uh, I tend to look at writing very technically. Like I look at um, the novel as a device with all these moving parts that I'd planned out and I was putting together, you know, to simulate reality in a certain way so a reader can experience it a certain way. But on the other hand, um, 
the process is also largely intuitive for me. You know, that there are pieces where I am drawing from dreams, there are pieces where I'm drawing from observation. Um, there are pieces where I'm drawing from like, you know, fading memories. It's this organic process at the same time. And um, so I'm kind of interested in that tension between those two, you know, how do we, how do we determine what is true knowledge, right. you know? Yeah. And I think writers and artists um, are people who are uniquely positioned, you know, to, to receive certain information through certain senses, through certain thoughts and um, translate them into art. And, you know, some of the time you're not even sure where the stuff is coming from. Right. And yeah, so I was very much interested in that. And it's one of the things that I was trying to figure out, with, you know, throughout the course of uh, 400 pages of writing this thing. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a moment where, uh, you know, the uncle asks her, like, oh, did they tell you our history in, in you know, in school? And she's like, no. And I was just like so devastated. Uh, to, you know, to think that, that you would, you know, such an important history that, you know, was very much of my, you know, my growing up. Um, and so I was like, oh, the, but that probably is reality. I know that there's a huge section of kind of Nigerian history that's missing from our, our textbooks. Um, yeah. So yeah, I was really interested in, in that idea that something that still seems so fresh to me that this new generation wouldn't have engaged with it was yeah. very haunting. I think another, uh -huh. oh, yeah, good. Oh, um, what's interesting about that is um, right after liberation, there was this kind of um, misguided idea that we could just rush straight to optimism and, you know, straight to kind of like a reconciled and fixed state. And we had to protect the minds of the children, you know, mm. not to kind of um, burden them with the past, but allow them to kind of be this future rainbow nation. But of course, history does not work like that. Right. And eventually, uh, you know, the stuff caught up and um, but also the public sphere became more receptive since right. then, you know, um, we really did start talking about everything wow. and it hasn't really gone back since then. But um, yeah, when I was growing up for a certain period right after liberation from 94, it definitely was, um, at least during when, uh, Nelson Mandela's term. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, there was kind of like this determined optimism. Right. You know, that makes which sense. meant well, okay. but. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If that stuff is there. Oh, well, I think that, yeah, I think throughout the continent, literature has been really invaluable in kind of reintroducing those missing conversations from history and into the public sphere. And I thought that that's one of the uses that we're seeing in, in the genre of science fiction, um, which, you know, this flowering that we're seeing of both Afrofuturism and African futurism seems kind of like the, because it's an, you know, ideal, ideal vehicle to critique history, history that often yeah. seems like insane and also advocate for a better future. Um, and I think we were just talking, I think this is our third book that has a uh, science fiction. We read uh, Dilmandila's collection of short stories out of Uganda. And then almost a year ago, Nnedi Okorfor came and spoke to us about Lagoon, which, you know, begins with an alien invasion of Nigeria and with them saying, well, you know, but this has been going on since the Portuguese, this is nothing new. And I love that parallel between settler colonialism and Absolutely. alien invasion. Um, so I was wondering like, what did sci-fi allow you to do with regard to kind of the, the South African context? And for me, I'm seeing like environmental degradation, the failure of truth and reconciliation, a variety uh -huh. of things. Yeah, um, so it, it was a way to explore those and also to explore the legacy of colonialism. But I also wanted it um, in terms of tone, right? I, I, I wanted to capture the eeriness of um, what it was like to grow up in certain parts of the country during certain times. And I remember even as a child that always been drawn to kind of science fiction narratives, this idea of um, humankind having a limited 
knowledge, you know, there's this idea that there was something happening beyond what we could imagine. Mm. And um, so I was always drawn to that as a, as a child and also how science fiction narratives um, would always, well, often present themselves as a critique, you know, of society and its structures, especially when it came to um, delineating power. Mm. And that's something that always stuck with me. And so as I was writing this book, and I knew that I wanted it to be set in Bisho, I knew I wanted to, to write about 1992 and the event that happened with the massacre. But I wanted to also capture it. I didn't want to write it straight. I wanted to capture how it also felt mm -hmm. um, for me. But also, because the book is not exactly um, autobiographical, I had to find <laughs> <laughs> I had to find a way to do that, um, which wasn't, you know, so direct. And I had all this love science fiction and science fiction was something that gave me that feeling almost viscerally, uh -huh. at least my childhood memories of it. And so I tried to, to, to bring that, you know, to this narrative through the genre, that element of uh, mystery, you know, of limited knowledge uh, or the great unknown. Mm. Um, so that's kind of, that was my visceral kind of attachment to it. And then intellectually, absolutely, as a way to critique um, the legacy of colonialism, to critique capitalist systems, and whether or not, you know, humankind can find a way to live that is serving for all, you know, yeah. instead of um, a few with centralized power. Right. So, um, yeah, very personal reasons, as well as, I guess, um, more cerebral reasons, but. Excellent, thank you. Um, great. I, so you've, you've talked about the reader a bit and I wanted to even drill in on this more because I read an interview where you said, aside from being a meditation on history and society, literature is also a human endeavor from the author, from me, the author to the readers and Triangulum is a novel that's designed to invite reader participation, which I was super excited about because I'd actually written uh, for Essay Daily an article, which I called The Triangle of African oh, wow. Literature. Yeah. Wow. And I, <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I that's like drew cool. a triangle and I was like, you know, in traditional African storytelling, there's the story, there's the storyteller and there's the audience and they're in this dynamic relationship. Yeah. And the storyteller, you know, anticipates what the audience needs and changes the story. And then the, you know, the listeners like either say, mm -mm, or they, or they, you know, so there's this sure, dynamic sure. thing, this, you know, this kind of dynamic thing. It's also, you know, maybe we could say choose your own adventure, but really inviting the reader in to kind of interact with the text Absolutely. in some way. And so I was wondering if you could just talk a bit about like when you're doing that, who was your ideal reader? And it seems like it might be a particular kind of generation of South African. And how do you create that intimacy that invites the reader to enter the text and engage with the various parts? Yeah, um, that's that's actually a great question. Um, I think, again, you know, after my goals with my first book were to try and simulate as much as I could, the experience of reality, like um, from a character's viewpoint, um, from their cognition, how they're experiencing their senses, um, their environment. So I was trying to simulate reality as much as I could. Um, and with this book, I, I wanted to go in opposite direction with Triangulum. I did want to assemble it as like a box um, with different parts that the reader had to um, put together. So right off, it's announcing that, you know, it's a book, it's a novel, um, it's got an author, it's, you know, it's basically revealing itself to you. Whereas with my first work, it's got more of a sleight of hand, you know, it's, which is in service of it being as immersive as possible. Whereas for Triangulum, part of that immersion is for you as the reader to put the thing together. And this was influenced because I also read and loved Choose Your Adventure uh, <laughs> books uh, when I was young. Um, and also, I guess, to some degree, role-playing games as well, yeah. you know, where you're given um, narrative and chunks and you have to play the game to solve it in order for the thing to kind of, you know, 
uh, fall into place. Um, so the generation that I was thinking of, actually, uh, I think I was casting my net pretty wide. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted the people who would get the pop culture references, but I also wanted the people who would remember the 80s and um, what it was like to live in the homeland states and to just kind of create a, a conversation between those different groups. Mm. Um, so I think as much as it's about, because people have read the book differently as well. Um, right. Some people love the first part, some people love the cyber espionage part. Other people love putting it together and you know reading it again. And But I think what I really wanted to do was capture as many readers as possible. And I made it interactive so that it could you know, um, not only that it could be fun, but also to drive in this point that it's an investigation of what constitutes the truth mm -hmm. and what constitutes real knowledge. And I'm inviting the reader in, you know, to kind of to participate and give me, you know, their thoughts mm -hmm. on uh, what is happening in the world of the book and, you know, just to some of the questions that it, it brings up. So um, that's something that I definitely wanted to do with this one. Perfect. Um, great. That well, that actually segues into my um, my last question, which is about kind of the the context and the setting. Because, I mean, it's been over a decade since I've been in South Africa, and I only I lectured at Wits just for a short period, but I spent most of my time in Johannesburg, and I feel much more familiar with Johannesburg, both physically, but also just in literature. And so, yeah. um, I, I I felt that like oh, I would even get so much more of what's happening. Like I would know the neighborhood references and I would know how to read people more if I were more familiar. So I was wondering just like, there's not, I'm not aware of a huge body of Eastern Cape literature. And so I'm wondering like, how did you approach that? What are your goals in creating something that's located in the Eastern Cape? And what is it you have to consider? What, what was I missing? What are you trying to bring to light there? Um, so you're right, there isn't a lot of writing about it, especially contemporary writing. And I think, you know, that's a bit tragic because it's a very interesting case in terms of um, how it fits in our history and also in our uh, public imagination. Yeah. You know, this idea of the homelands and their legacies is something that's still very real and tells a very particular South African story. Um, which is about, you know, conquest, um, collaboration, and, you know, the promise of liberation without it's necessarily, uh, without it necessarily being delivered. Um, so I was interested in that. And also, I guess it's, it figures largely in my own origins um, as a person and also as a writer. And I've always been fascinated um, with the idea of bringing it onto the page um, in a way that felt real. So it was also like a very personal endeavor. Yeah. But um, yeah, intellectually, it's always been about exploring where this place fits in the larger scheme of things and what it can tell us about the country you know, yeah. and possibly where the country could be headed. Um, so yeah, those are my main motivations for the Eastern Cape. And yes, um, very real references, very, um, I made sure that, you know, I revisited some places. It was beautiful, actually. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that part of the book, um, getting to see more of the country and writing about it. You know, I, I always um, feel that there's something that you do um, when you write about things, or rather when you elevate the literature and you do it um, intentionally and with care and with research that can be very rewarding, not just for you as a writer, but um, for readers as well. Mm -hmm. And I say for myself as a writer, because um, whenever I do it, I start to discover all these things that I wasn't even aware of, that I knew or remembered. Mm -hmm. And by the time I'm finished writing about the places that remains with me, you know, right. um, it's like I've tapped into them um, on a much richer level and I'm able to carry that with me afterwards. Mm -hmm. So yeah, writing about the Eastern Cape is something I always wanted to do. Um, I tried my hand at it a couple of years ago with a short story that I wrote um, called Space, um, which actually ended up winning an award, which got me my first book deal. 
Oh wow. But then yeah. <laughs> um so I parked it after that. I wrote a book about Cape Town and this was kind of me returning to the, you know, to fulfill this thing that I'd started. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank yeah. you. Um I forgot to ask you to read, which is normally how we start things. I was just so excited when you showed up. <laughs> <laughs> so we have amazing questions from the audience that are in the chat, but I wanna also make sure that we, we get to hear your voice. So maybe that can be a transition. Um, or okay, you Okay, sure. Um, all right, so I will ask how much time I have to read because sometimes I tend to you know, read for quite a long time. So really? I have, yeah, I have, I have about, uh, three options that I've selected. Uh, one is very brief. Um, one I think is in the middle and one is a bit lengthy. <laughs> <laughs> what do we want? <laughs> um, we don't have anywhere to be. <laughs> I, think I think you should uh, choose what, what you would really like to read to us. I think okay. any length is okay. Oh, okay. and people would like to know the page numbers so they can follow along at home. All right, um, cool. So I was actually about to read from a different book, but- oh, You could do that as well. <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> yeah, um, okay. But I think it's, I think it's page um, on the version that you have, it would be, on mine, it is. Oh, that's right. Twenty nine, and yeah, let me just the American version. Most of us. Um, yeah, I can find it. It's not a problem. Or you can read from the other book. That's fine. Okay. I'd be happy to hear something. I'm sure. Yeah, readers will be able to find this. It's. It's the it's the it's the title sec it's the date title section twenty first November nineteen ninety nine. Okay, I think I'll I'll start. Twenty first November nineteen ninety nine. Mama and Dada were journalists for different papers when they met, four years before I was born. In 1981, when Lennox Leslie said, the chief of Amakunukweb was handed a golden pen to sign the Siskai into an independent state. Beat Gornhoff, the Minister of Constitutional Development and Cooperation, awarded him the Order of Good Hope, the apartheid republic's highest accolade. It was reported that there were over 8,000 people in attendance that night, honoring the segregation of Amakosa from the European Republic, but Mama and Dada were not among them. It was the 4th of December and the receptionist's desk at Freer Hospital in East London had been vacant for an hour. A sullen cleaner slopped a wet mop over the lilonium, dragging it past the bench where they sat apart, feeling cold, their hands idling and they laughs. From another room, a radio next to a patient's bed reported on how the cis guy had completed the process of secession. Dada walked to the counter and stood there, sighing, then went back to the bench and sucked on his teeth, which is when the woman next to him laughed. For the first time, they turned to each other. Dada volunteered that he'd brought a neighbor's son to the hospital a quiet child who'd fallen out of a tree and broken his shin bones. Not one, but both of them, if she could imagine. Mama could. Her visit wasn't dissimilar. It was also a favor to a neighbor's child, she explained. A child who, on top of suffering from malnutrition, had developed an inflamed intestine. Mama, who'd worked as a teacher before, had often seen such cases. More so, she added, in the township than when she'd been in the village. Dada nodded, unsurprised, although he cautioned. His experience had left him with an opposing view. His people came from the other side of the river. He'd seen things worse than hunger. 
Mama nodded as the receptionist returned to her post. It wasn't uncommon to use an employer's insurance on a neighbor's ill child. Four years later, as the Siskite began to buckle under the weight of its despot, Sebe, and Mama insisted on leaving before the situation grew worse, they would return to the same hospital to have their own ill child. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So, um, well, if you don't want to read to us from something else, then we can move to questions, more questions from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, we could move to questions, um, although, I don't know. Um, let's see. If you make us fall in love with another book, then we'll go out and buy it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, right, right. Um, I actually have a, um, a new book that, that, that I just released, um, but it's, it's in a limited edition. Mm. Um, yeah, it's from this new project, from this new pop-up pub publisher oh, wow. um, that, I, that I founded. Uh, we mainly do experimental literature, so it's, it's very new. Yeah, oh but I, yeah, I'll, sh I'll share it with you. Um, I have, um, this is not about it, but this is, this is the cover. It's called uh, Native Life in the Third Millennium. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, it's poetry and prose. How but, about it? Uh, yeah, okay. Like, yeah, I love that. More, more on that later. Right? Okay, yeah, I could talk like experimental genre <laughs> with you all afternoon slash evening, um, but I am going to, since we are a small enough group, um, I'm just gonna ask people to unmute themselves and ask their questions. And I have, um, I put the number there and then if you, <clears throat> and then just email me if there's, uh, if you have a question that I haven't numbered there, so. Okay. Thanks, Faith. Hi, I'm Sean. First, I wanted to say that the, the prose of this novel is so, and I'm not all the way through, but I, I'm, I'm a good way in. And I found the prose so confident, self-assured and straightforward, but not heavily stylized in, in its minimalism, that it was like experiencing the work of a, a fully evolved mid-career writer. So I don't know a great deal about your personal History. I could tell from from the photos of you that you were a young writer, but I'm really I'm really excited to read the rest of your work. So, thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I have a question about the I guess the the voice of Dr. Uh, Marianne Dixon, perhaps uh, the voice of the memoirist. It's revealed early on that um, due to her experience with SSRIs, that this has had some impact on her kind of low affect communication style as a speaker. And I wondered yeah. if this was something that you were intentionally kind of bringing into her voice as a writer. Um, you know, sometimes when I've read a, read a work that is as, layered and complex in the narrative structure, I find that the writing style itself almost kind of rhymes. There's a rhythmic kind of fractal cohesion between the structure of the work and the, the structure of the writing itself. And in, in this book, the, the themes are really complex. You have you know, a, a layered kind of multi-genre style and then also kind of the story within the story packaged with recordings. There's a lot of rich complexity to that. And I found the writing voice, or at least what I'm, what I'm engaging with thus far to be delightfully straightforward and efficient. So there's this interesting contrast between the, the voice and the structure, I guess, for me, in terms of how I'm experiencing it. So I'm wondering if you're intentionally carrying that low affect speaking style that 
this this person, perhaps Marianne Dixon, you know, demonstrates as a speaker, if you're carrying that into the voice of the novel itself, the writing of the novel, the, the writing style. And if this was a, a knowing point of contrast with the complexity of the structure and the complexity of the themes. Thank you, Sean. That's, um, that's a fantastic question. Um, Cause I am actually really preoccupied with voice. I, I spend a lot of time working on, um, you know, the voices of like characters or the voices of books actually um, that I work on. It's, it's, it's definitely one of the things that are high on my list in terms of getting um, a project right. And it was interesting with this character because um, on one hand, yes, it fits the story world. And she is someone who's had this history of mental illness. Um, but at the same time, it also kind of intersects with a certain kind of teen sensibility that I was also trying to tap into, you know, of um, a character who's more introverted, um, inward, uh, observant. Um, but in terms of the minimalism and the stripped down narration and how that contrasts with the complexity of the book, Absolutely. Um, I wanted it to have all these things, but I didn't want the book to lose its intimacy or the easy purchase a reader could have, you know, as it got crazier and crazier. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was something that was very important to me. And uh, it's something that I've also, like, I wish I could take full credit for, but I've seen it, um, you know, done by some really great writers before me as well. And it's got a way of taking these kind of larger issues and making them personal in a way that um, I really, really, really wanted to bring across in this book because I wanted them to belong to the characters and I wanted them to be something that um, the reader you know, could feel enough confidence to, to grapple with as well. Um, I didn't want it to kind of communicate these ideas from a perch, you know, above, um, above the reader or above an intimate reading experience. So um, absolutely. And thank you for being such a good reader. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> Is it my turn? Can you guys yeah. hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that that aligns with kind of where my mind was going. And this is back to the conversation point about um, using science fiction um, as a kind of, and I texted Faith on the side. I was like, oh, I get, I, I just realized something. Yeah. Um, the science fiction thread um, acted as like a metaphor for me of her pills and how it kind of allowed us to kind of suspend ourselves because when it comes to history that is often, you know, misrepresented or left out, it get like people kind of close up and it's hard to kind of, you know, absorb it. And so by, by easing us into it with that kind of, hey, we're gonna suspend ourselves and open up. It became kind of, I can never forget the historical anecdotes that were sprinkled in throughout the, throughout wow. the, the novel. Wow. But, um, not but, what was <laughs> really interesting to me was like how this ended up being a, a, like a love story mm. and a series of love stories. Um, most interesting to me was between Tata and Mama and how it was able to kind of move through, be super forgiving. Like you were trying to teach us about how fluid love is and how with the kind of tone of the narrator, right? How, how you capture the, the, the voice of a time traveler who was kind, who was very, who had this um, perspective that only a time traveler would have even as she was moving through that, that pencil, right? At the, same, at the same time. So I thought that was really interesting. Wow, um, I, I don't know if I can even add anything to that. That's brilliant. Um, <laughs> I think absolutely the science fiction element um, was interesting as well for me because these are the story of our country um, is something now that has been like repackaged and like retold to us. 
uh, so often that people immediately have um, almost imaginative fatigue when you encroach on the topic of apartheid. Like it's saturated the narrative. So by approaching it through science fiction, as well as through this narrator who is kind of looking at her society from a place of um, being removed, you know, um, whether or not it's her slightly being alienated or from her medication, was a way of taking these old stories or these over familiar stories and deconstructing them, you know, because I still think that they matter. You know, I still think what happened during those, um, those years matters and actually has a bearing on what might happen in our future. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, you have to find a way to make it interesting for yourself as a writer and also for your readers. So that was definitely one of the strategies. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Aubrey. Okay. Hi. Um, nice to meet you. I'm Aubrey. Um, I Hi, was Aubrey. really curious about your decision to make the narrator um, a nameless person and like a nameless girl slash woman. Like, what made you decide not to give this character a name? Because I feel like there's so much like power in a name in some cases, like it's what it's how you and most people know themselves, it's what other people call you. And so to like not see that in a main character, like to not see that inherent power of like having a name was like very fascinating to me. And so I, I was just curious about your choice on that. Yeah. Um, I guess there are two reasons. One is um, for this the story world, it was important that she remain anonymous um, because these are her documents and she doesn't want to be found. Um, but the more I also wrote it, you know, beyond that premise, it became very interesting for me in the sense that I wanted um, to allow the space for kind of the reader to project, to participate by projecting and filling out, you know, what wasn't actually said about this character, um, to engage them in solving the mystery of like who this person is and is what they're telling us, you know, really true and getting to know everything else about them and experiencing them as a person first before you believed, you know. Um, so yeah, questions around um, narrative authority, questions around, you know, who the author is, and um, yeah, just really wanting to fill out that experience and make it an interactive. Although I have to say, uh, I, I've, I've since received quite a lot of pressure to reveal the name of this character. And I don't know, I don't know, maybe in future I'll leak something, maybe she'll leak something, you know, and she'll appear somewhere and um, we'll finally know what she's called. <laughs> there is, thanks Aubrey. <laughs> Thank you so much for this discussion. I feel like this just expanded my whole understanding of the book and just appreciation for science fiction as a genre as well. Mm. I think often it it's used to critique both history and the present day that we're living in and kind of expand upon potential realities. And so um, I was really compelled by that kind of last third of the book where we get into these concepts of eco-terrorism and the returners um, Eco-terrorism is, is something that I'm very slightly familiar with, just in an academic context studying environmental justice. Um, yeah. So I'm curious if you could expand upon like the research and inspiration that went into formulating um, this group, the returners, and the work that they're doing. Oh, awesome. Uh, so I, I guess I've been interested in a group like this um, for a while, you know, um, and kind of intersects, you know, with my own kind of um, interest in ecology um, and, you know, in the, in the safety of the environment. And also, you know, this idea of standing in opposition um, to a capitalist structure. And the thing is, when in South Africa, um, our capitalism is like very like explicitly racialized. And as, a, as an economic system, it's almost, um, it was inherited by a liberation government almost without like um, apparent, you know, change. 
and uh, it's a system so much of the world also uses. Um, but with us, it intersects very badly with our history because the people who are marginalized in the previous regime um, live on to be marginalized in the present. And it's been difficult to try and imagine an alternative to this. So uh, the returners um, came to me as you know, a possible, a possible um, hypothetical alternative to how things are. And um, so I was very interested in them as a group that represented that. And I was also interested them, in them as um, a group that allowed me to, to research um, you know, certain aspects of um, environmental activism and concerns as well, you know, and investigating this relationship that we have with our habitat, which um, I don't know, it depends on where you go. You know, some people are concerned and some people are indifferent. And um, yeah, I just wanted to explore it. And yeah, when I started imagining them and, you know, how they saw things and like the extremeness. Uh, I got fascinated in that world, but I was also interested in um, the idea of the tank, the people who believe that they could work um, alongside, you know, uh, the system. And um, yeah, it's, it's actually also a, a conversation that intersects with my interest in decolonial theory as well where you'll find that split in that school too, that um, we can, you know, the marginalized can appropriate what's already existing and open it up and decentralize it, you know, for everyone who's marginalized. Whereas other people believe that this system cannot be salvaged. Um, we have to go back and we have to kind of completely disavow it. And so I was reading a lot of people, you know, going between the stances and um, I guess this was my own way to contribute to that, you know, through fiction. Thank you. Fascinating. Great. Thank you, Nia. Um, I guess I'm next, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question about your references to government corruption in South Africa. Uh, for example, the paper mill, where mm. government officials are taking bribes. And I was wondering how much that is a reflection on the actual corruption that does exist in your country. I was there about a year and a half ago, and I can't say I talked to a representative number of people there, but uh, I know that particularly in the province that contains Cape Town, which is controlled by a different political party, people that were very vocal about government corruption. So I was wondering how what you portray in the book reflects what's actually going on in your country. Um, to some degree, it does. Um, largely, a lot of the stories that are reported in the book, even in the second part, um, where there's a government agency that's supposed to disperse social grants, but um, it colludes with a payment agency mm -hmm. uh, from the United States, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah, and lots of people lose out on that grant. This is a real thing that happened, you know? So uh, yeah, corruption is something that does plague the country. At this point, it's almost like a public health crisis because the people yeah. who are affected the most, you know, are the people who need the most help. Um, so it's just one of those things, you know, that coincides, you know, it, it coexists with this legacy of colonialism. Yeah. And um, I'm just one writer I, amongst many, you know, who tried to bring light to it, uh, you know, amongst other things. Um, so, yeah. Um, there is corruption. It does make it into the book. It, it <laughs> makes it into most of my work, actually. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, you, as a writer, you, you kind of, you live, you experience life, you, you come up with these crazy kind of things that you imagine, but also um, you're part of a conversation that's, that's going on in media, that's going on in right. other mediums. Um, 
you know, and yeah, so it wouldn't surprise me that the next thing I write in some capacity includes this as well. Mm -hmm. I, for me, I'd say one of the most impactful moments was just, there's just this one half page where they show up to school and they discover that it's bankrupt because of some fraud scheme and they have nothing to do but sit down and wait for someone to lead them in prayer. I was like, that is just the history of colonialism <laughs> right there in that moment. Exactly. It was, I was like, that is a devastating tiny paragraph that captured it all. So, Exactly. Yeah. Um, on, that, on that point, actually, um, I don't know if you guys are aware, uh, aware of this, but there's an Easter egg in the book. Um, in the foreword, uh, there's a mention of a website where all these records have been kept. Uh, so that website, that URL is actually live and you can find more of what I read and what I researched um, to write this book basically. So it'll contain all the references and all the links to the new stories. So it's kind of like a thing you can go and look through as well. Um, so that's triangulum-earth.com. Um, so it'll have all that stuff actually. I tried to go and it said, it's not protected. Are you going to go forward? And I was like, oh no. Really? <laughs> I was like, what do I do? <laughs> I wonder if it's because you should add the W's in the beginning. I don't know. Oh, okay. It's safe though. It's safe, trust me. It's safe. Okay. That was so funny. <laughs> it's safe. You were definitely safe. having fun. <laughs> um, I, I wonder if I could do it here and like um, do a... Uh, oh, and then share screen with us? Share screen with you guys. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing the not secure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just opened it and it wasn't. I didn't get the not secure. It opened right up for me. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, it, I have a faulty system or something that lets me go into unsecure. <laughs> <laughs> a freer system, a more liberated system <laughs> than uh, ours. Here, actually, I'll share my screen so people can see it. Okay, yeah. okay, great. Um, Let's have an interactive good time. There we go. All yeah. right. So mm -hmm. the novel ends okay. on three. So this is four. This is the, the special. Right. Um, Easter egg behind the scenes. So, um, yeah, not a, not too long a list, but some stuff if you're interested in just what fed into the book thematically and also in terms of um, some of the research and um, some of the crazier things about the book too, um, including the, the the education system that they under when the school goes bankrupt. Um, as well as um, the story about the political prisoners as well. Mm. Yeah. Um, and part of my motivation in doing this as well was to kind of, um, it's a science fiction book, but the country is like, I think crazy enough to sustain it with its actual like facts and like reporting. And um, yeah, that's another thing I was interested in playing around with. Oh my gosh, have fun. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, as I warned you, we would trick you into staying longer. And we have. Oh, really? <laughs> I, I didn't even notice. <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> I didn't even notice. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for being so generous and so present. And it's just uh, lovely having you here. Thank you, Faith. I, um, this was extremely pleasant for me as well. You know, um, it's great to be able to do things like this still. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I find a lot of solace in it and deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> and yeah, I'll be on the lookout for, I really want to get the experimental book and continue to have a conversation with you about this, this publishing that you're doing. It sounds really exciting. Yeah, let's talk about that. I'd love to. Yeah. And thank you, everyone uh, who's a member of this book club. Thank you for reading my work. Uh, thank you for being here today, um, holding space with me, talking about 
you know, language, science fiction, history. <laughs> um, I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Those are great questions. And we have some people who joined in later who we haven't really met. Feel free to uh, put in the chat where you're where you're uh, calling in from. So, so we have like 14 minutes left. Um, what do we want to talk about? I just want to say that I'm really grateful that we had this conversation and I feel like I did not read that book closely enough at all. And I would like to go back and read it again. <laughs> I think I missed a lot of what you guys all got out of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's so, um, yeah, he's so smart and so thoughtful of the things he's doing. Um, you know, behind everything and stuff like that. I really enjoyed that conversation and everything that I read about him. I really enjoyed. So. I want to corroborate what Elizabeth said is, I learned a lot about the book by listening to him. I mean, yeah. um, it's not that I didn't understand the book at all, but I mean, this, this gave me such a broader perspective on how the pieces of the book fit together. Right. And um, I was very impressed by his style of writing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he writes very well. Yeah. Uh, I, I was really impressed by his style of writing. Plus that the book was easy to read, even though there were some complicated ideas and situations, but it was easy to read. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel I had to labor over the book in any sense. Right. Yeah, he has this, he has this real confidence, I think that Sean alluded to, you know, for such a young writer, it's just like, pew. Um, and then it's just a matter of figuring out, there's a lot you had to keep in your head. Yeah, yeah. Like all the pieces. And for me, anything that has numbers involved, I immediately just like, <laughs> start to see red and can't like remember anything. I'm like, oh my God, there's science and there's numbers, I won't be able to like keep it. Um, but yeah, on some level, just the, the characters, the voice, the language. Uh, it's like very easy to process. Yeah. yeah. I really appreciate how he kept himself, like the, the diligence and the work. This is like a thesis, right? Like the dude gave us a bibliography at the end. <laughs> right. You know, and I felt like it just shows how committed he is to truth and the rhetoric like, and I think like rhetoric has gotten like a bad rep mm. because of who's been in charge of rhetoric. Um, but now it's like, no, you're actually supposed to find creative ways in giving us truth so that we can actually hear it, right? And then keep, and then show us like it, like the confidence, it all comes through because he's like, listen, this is the work. I did it. Like, I, yeah, it's here. Yeah. You'll get it if you if you look closely enough. Right, I, right. It's really like the Easter egg in there. It's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Eva, I I had hoped that um, Aubrey, who I don't think is still here, Aubrey's question I was very interested in, but it was a complex one, which for this conversation centered on the naming of the main character lacking a name, but I was really interested in this being a woman, girl, woman. And for me, that was, it. and it's a queer woman. And for me as a queer woman, it was a little bit jarring. Like I, I was, I was um, wrestling with that in the narrative throughout the book, like some ways of speaking, ways of certain encounters, you know, it just was very, um, it was interesting and contrasted greatly for me with the previous book that we read about Silence is My Mother Name, who's also sort of a cisgendered male person with a female protagonist in it. So it just was so interesting. I was thinking about that a lot. So I was hoping to hear what that was about, how that was decided, why to do that and how. Ask. 
but I, well, you know, I, there was number six. We didn't have time. I, <laughs> I thought that was Aubrey's question. I was hoping it was like, oh, I, so I was waiting for that. But he's got like paragraphs of things to say. So this was so fascinating. I loved everyone's questions and Faith, your, your discussion with him was so enriching. I really appreciate it. I, I agree with what Elizabeth said. It's very enriching. So, yeah. But you're right. I totally, I like, how did I miss that? I was just like, wait. <laughs> like a queer girl protagonist wait you know I mean I remember just when I was like reading these things I was just like it's really interesting just like the use of sex and coming of age was so interesting because it was just like you know we're seeking out a mystery but we stopped and had a threesome but then we like continued on I mean it was just like I was just like you go I mean it was like so interesting <laughs> I like the they weren't obsessed with like their hormones. They just like took care of business and then went back to the things that they were interested in, which I thought was such an interesting take on, you know, the adolescent uh, point of view. So, but and yeah, I'm sorry. We uh, sorry. I'd like to piggyback on that a little bit because I found the approach to gender in this novel particularly fascinating. Um, I, I identify as on the agender spectrum and there was an agendered quality mm. to the, the queer female bodied protagonist mm -hmm. that reminded me almost of my, my earliest experiences of reading Heinlein as a, as a teenager. Mm. Some, of, some of his approaches to gender. In um, Silence is My Mother Tongue, there's a, um, a transgender sort of a uh, dyad mm -hmm. taking place, sort of a conversation between the, sib the siblings, uh, a, a somewhat gender non-conforming sister right. and uh, a trans feminine male bodied person. You know, I, 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 I don't know if, you know, I, if you know, fully identifying as a, as, a, as a woman was something that I took away from that and so, so yeah, it's always interesting to me if there's an opportunity for gender non-normativity to be explored in multiple ways. And so what I found about the gender non-normativity of this story, and this maybe fits into the very matter of fact quality of the way that sexuality is dealt with, you know, it, it isn't, there isn't this very like fine detailed, visceral, almost like you're there with them description of sexual encounters. Mm -hmm. It is, you know, like a maybe sometimes like a five sentence or five word sentence, you know, like a like a box. It's very, it's very minimal. And I found the the gender ambiguity of that character to also be very minimal and straightforward. So there's a there's almost like an an echo. The, the quality of this character's gender, the approach to sexuality and the writing style are all very straightforward and, and simple. I, I appreciated it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's fascinating. So much stuff. So rich. This shows these points 34. That's hilarious. I just want to say I appreciated how he was talking about the inspiration or when the topic came up about the choose your own adventures. Um, I think that just makes so much sense when reading the book. And in a way, I think what Elizabeth was saying too, about having to reread it in a way, um, while I was reading, I was trying to figure out, okay, do I pay attention to the timestamps on all of these different recordings, I'm not sure I focus all my energy on tracking the, the timeline of these or focusing on the content. And so my brain was having a hard time trying to switch back and forth. And so I think reading a, it again with a different focus would be really interesting mm -hmm. if you actually tried to chart the different recordings and piece together, okay, what is the trajectory of all of these different scenes um, and vignettes in a way, or just focusing on the content itself and not worrying about when, what order did things happen in. Um, so I like the fact that it seems like if you reread this book, you're, you might have a whole yeah. different layered experience um, to it, which it seems that that was in part his intent. Right, right. That's such a good point. And for me, I was always also wondering, like, do are these dates resonant in South African history? And I just, you know, there are things I don't know myself. And what's the significance of placing the future so close to the current future, but just a little bit. So 
yeah, it's really, it is so interesting. I mean, sometimes I just felt like it, he's just trying to say a while ago and now it wasn't that far away, but then, yeah, you never know like what you're supposed to be paying attention to, what you're supposed to be looking at. Um, and that's the, that's the challenge around using a collage structure in which there's no kind of hierarchy of information. Everything's just placed there and you've got to like sift through the artifacts yourself and kind of try to, it asks a lot of readers, uh, but it also then does make a potential reading. You can have multiple reading experiences. Um, that's really interesting. So, hmm. Yeah, that, there was one time thing that you bring that up for me, Faith, that when Nelson Mandela was released, mm -hmm. it, it seemed wrong in the book, but I didn't, <laughs> didn't want to get into because I happened to be in not, I've never been to South Africa, but I was in Tanzania when Nelson Mandela was released. And Tanzania is the first country that he came to within three weeks of release. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a strong, I know exactly when that is and it doesn't <laughs> match with what it said. So I was like, that is not when it was. He was already, <laughs> you know, so I, but I don't know if that was intentional or I don't know, or maybe he's talking about something else, but it was like, I know that time exactly because I was, at that place at that time seeing Nelson Mandela so it was so interesting yeah yeah we were all kind of frozen in time when that happened you're like you remember where you were yeah that's interesting I missed I didn't catch that missed that Very interesting oh okay yes thank you Nia our next book fairy tales for lost children um which is um Queer narratives, it's short stories about uh, LGBTQ characters um, in Somalia, Kenya, and uh, UK. And it's written by this um, artist, Jerry Osman. I, uh, check out his website, it's like crazy, it's amazing. He looks really cool. Um, and writing is just one of the things he does. Um, So I've been wanting to read this book for a long time. It was hard to it was hard to get for a while, and now um, I think there are enough of them. Uh, that's what we'll be doing. But it'll just be us. I'm not even going to try to get him. Is it is it in the bookstore for Mo, the Moad bookstore now? Okay. Yes, it is. It was kind of hard to actually find the publisher of it. Um, it's not available in many places. Um, so we are available at the Moad bookstore. Yay! Thank you, Nia. And then we have March's book um, is the Veronique Tajo uh, in the company of men, right? So we're set for the next couple of months. Yes, and I'll be interviewing her next month and then uh, we'll read her in March. Um, and it's getting, it's gonna be, I just saw that it's gonna be sponsored on NPR and a number of things, number of lists, anticipated books coming up, so. She lives in South Africa. I met her in South Africa years ago, or she used to live in South Africa. Who knows where she lives now? She's Ivoirian, but I think was teaching in South Africa. And I had written a really cool book also about the genocide in Rwanda. And so this is about e Ebola, stories around Ebola. So that'll be interesting. So I think that's it. I think we're good. Thank you so much. It's so nice to see some people here in faith. That's like so. This is a great book club, like the best book club I've ever been in. It's really. <laughs> well, that's good to be y'all. Thanks so much for coming, for reading, for asking such great, great uh, questions. And um, is there anybody else who's new here that we haven't welcomed? Hey, Christina. Hi, thanks for having me. My pleasure. Hey, Christina. <laughs> Pamela. <you> like <laughs> so Pamela invited me. I'm on the board of a nonprofit, the African Library Project. And oh, she okay. thought I would enjoy it. And I'm not quite finished with the book. I'm almost done with it. And I'd lived in South Africa for a while. So mm -hmm. I was excited to read a little bit about it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Yeah, definitely. Tell your friends. Yay. We're here for everyone, and it's so great to be online, actually. I mean, there's good pros and cons, but yeah, having the author, having the author teleport in from South Africa was definitely a plus. So. Yeah.
Um, I just want to mention another uh, literary program that we're going to have at Moab mm -hmm. that's not part of the African Book Club, but on um, February 23rd, I'm going to just put it in the chat now, we're partnering with Litquake and we're going to be discussing a book called Raceless by Georgina Lawton. And um, it's a memoir about um, a mixed race woman who was raised by white parents and basically not acknowledged that she was black and till and didn't really deal with it until she was an adult. So it's about that. Mm -hmm. um, and she's gonna be in conversation with Jess Cole, who's a really interesting um, writer and model from England. So they're all British. It'll be interesting. Yeah, they're all British. <laughs> it's a British thing. <laughs> That'll be really interesting, huh? Yeah. yeah. I've been doing a lot of stuff on passing lately. I taught a seminar on passing in uh, January. Yeah, earlier this month. And um, that film version just came out of the Noah Larson's passing it screen at Sundance last night. And um, some interesting conversations out there too. So inadvertent passing, I guess in her case. <laughs> That's also the New York Times book club selection for March. Or February, okay. passing, yeah. Oh, okay. And Britt Bennett is going to be um, speaking or leading. Or okay. Whatever. Yeah, I taught her. Yeah, I taught her in my seminar. Um, I actually really recommend this book that a student of mine wrote, um, "The Invisible Line." Uh, and it's three families from the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s that crossed the color line back and forth. Sometimes they were black, sometimes they were white. One of them, a couple of them were Confederate soldiers. Um, I mean, there's just crazy stuff. One of them went to Oberlin and then slave catchers went to try to like get him and like all the white students went out with guns and like surrounded the slave catchers. And like, I mean, it's just, there's like amazing historical drama brought to life here um, and really well documented. So it's super fun history. Um, so I use that as the basis of you know, the other narratives. Is it historical fiction or history? History. Oh, wow. That's He's a law professor at Vanderbilt. And um, yeah, but he writes as if, it, you know, it reads like a novel lots of times, but it's very well researched history. So it's super fun. Uh, and the audio version is really good too. So. Cool. Well, thank you so much for both facilitating and also all the book recs. I feel like every meeting we have, we come away with like five more books to read. <laughs> <Just one laughs> Um, and I'm uh, surrounded by stacks of things I need to read. <laughs> but I also want to thank everyone for being here and joining us um, at this this month's African Book Club. And so again, we have next month's coming up on um, February 28th. So we hope that you'll come back and join us. Um, if you're looking for the book, we have it at Moad and we do appreciate any and all support. Um, so if you are able to donate to the museum, um, Elizabeth has put that information in the chat as well about donating via our website. Um, you can also donate by phone by texting 56512 and typing MOAD SF. Um, we also value your feedback. And so we do have a um, program survey. It just takes a couple moments to fill out. Um, it helps us you know, best serve our community. So we appreciate that as well. Um, the QR code at the bottom of the screen will also take you directly to that link as well. So I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your Sunday and we hope to see you again next month or before then at any of our other programming that we're doing. Thank you all. Thank you, Mia. Everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. See you next month. All right. To date. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.